All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day two of our annual Alexander von Humboldt Foundation meeting. I'm very glad to see all of you. And it's my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker to you. Um, Angela Schoelig is an associate professor at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies and a faculty member of the Wechter Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Professor Schoelig holds a Canada Research Chair in Machine Learning for Robotics and Control and a Canada Sci-Fi Chair in Artificial Intelligence. Professor Scholling holds both a Master of Science in Engineering Cybernetics from the University of Stuttgart and also a Master of Science in Engineering Science and Mechanics from the Georgia Institute of Technology. She earned her PhD at ETH Zurich, where her doctor doctorate was awarded the ETH Medal and the Dimitris N. Korafas Foundation Award. And that was only the start of a great number of research awards, scholarships and robotics challenges that Professor Scholleck has won ever since. So Professor Scholleck, it is our honor to have you today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And um, I'm looking forward to your keynote speech very much. But before we start the lecture, let me make a few technical remarks. First of all, we would like to let you know that this keynote speech is video recorded and will be published on Humboldt Foundation's web page. So please turn off your camera if you want to keep your privacy. Um, anyway, you are welcome if you want to, to turn on your cameras for the discussion to have a more lively interaction. During the um, question and answer session, you may either write your questions directly into the chat and we will read them out loud for Professor Schoelig, or you may just type the word question into the chat and wait until we ask you to unmute yourself and ask your questions directly to Professor Schoelig. Professor Schoelig, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thanks everybody, welcome. It's an honor to be part of this event and to connect with all of you. I'm not monitoring the chat, so if there are any technical issues or questions, um, Please speak up. Um, my talk focuses on how we use machine learning in robotics to improve the performance of robots. And there are unique challenges compared to more mature applications of machine learning. And one of them includes guaranteeing the safety of the robot and the environment and having to work with limited amounts of data. So let me start by showing you just where I'm coming from. So, I started my academic career studying control theory in Germany and uh, the US. And control theory is really the math that describes systems that move or change over time and teaches us methods how we can influence these systems. And so having this math background during my PhD, I started to work with robots and use control theory to make robots fly. And so this, just gives you an impression how that looked like. So I was interested in showing the physical capabilities of these flying robots and use control theory to achieve precise and accurate and really dynamic motions. However, the robot receives commands from the computer 70 times per second. So 70 times per second, we tell this flying robot what to do. And if we would make one mistake, it could easily crash. And, um, but we developed these control algorithms to a point where it led to projects such a, like this. So this was a collaboration with Cirque du Soleil. And it later led to a Broadway show called Paramour that ran from 2016 to 2017 in New York. And so here the robots are the lampshades, and yes, their motion is fully pre-programmed and the actor is really adapting to that pre-programmed motion. Um, but the robots provide a new way of artistic expression in this case. And so this project for me also reflects what robotics is all about. It's about expanding what humans can do. And so after 
even during my PhD, actually, I started to incorporate more and more machine learning towards um, addressing the limits that traditional, more model-based control approaches have and to enable robot motion that would otherwise not be possible. And ever since I have been working at this intersection of control theory, robotics and machine learning, and I have an amazing team of students and collaborators who are really behind all the th things you see today. So if you come to our lab, you do not only see the students working hard, but also lots of robots. So this is our lab at the University of Toronto. We develop algorithms for teams of robots. So here you see 25 flying robots um, coordinating their motion. And so these robots have become so capable that we can take them out of the lab. And so what you see in a second is a mock-up nuclear power plant where we fly um, and use these vehicles for monitoring tasks. We work also on algorithms to fly these robots outdoors based on computer vision only and not relying on GPS, which would enable a more reliable operation, for example, if these robots deliver um, packages. And we drive off-road and also on the road. And so here you see our car during a self-driving car competition in Michigan, which we won over the last four years. And finally, this is a mobile manipulator, um, which we think can be really useful in warehouse environments or eventually in the home. So let me start by asking, why are we so excited about robotics right now? So we believe that we really can make the leap from applications that you see in, on the left in dedicated structured environments to more complex environments and tasks. So these robots um, leave the industrial setting and become increasingly mobile, adaptive, and interactive. And so examples that you see here range from exoskeletons to support the human motion to self-driving cars. And so why do we think this is all happening now? So it's really a trend driven by a lot of key enablers. And some of them are inexpensive lightweight sensors. And you all have a phone and basically all the sensors in your phone can fly a, you know, can fly a, a drone. So um, the mobile phone industry has driven a lot of the um, sensor development. We have increasingly powerful and distributed compute, high bandwidth and low latency communications. And as a result, we get access to increasing amounts of data, which we can then make sense of by leveraging novel algorithmic um, uh, developments in machine learning. And finally, we also see an increase in available open source software tools and data sets, which really accelerates research. So what it also means is that we have all this amazing technology as enabling technology for robotics, but we have not fully leveraged all the new tools that are available from communications and compute to sensing and machine learning. And so this really requires a tight integration of these technologies, which is not trivial by itself, right? It, it's integration of hardware and software and data and integration of more first principles and physics with, with data. So this is really a fascinating opportunity for innovation. Uh, and that is where, where lots of robotics researchers work on. And really a key here is that these enabling technologies help us to build more capable robots. If we are able to kind of dissolve some of the boundaries between these disciplines, especially between you know, the engineering disciplines and computer science. And so one way to think about all of this is, um, and the research I'm doing is on the one hand, you know, we have artificial intelligence um, and, without you know, going into details about 
how to exactly define it, but one thing way to think about artificial intelligence is software that automatically performs complex virtual tasks. And then on the other hand, we have robotics, which you could define as programmable hardware that automatically performs relatively simple physical tasks. That's the, the industrial robots we see. But really at the intersection, you could, our goal is to build intelligent robots that autonomously sense the environment, make decisions, learn to perform complex tasks, for example, in your home or in a hospital um, or drive on the road. So why is it really challenging to use artificial intelligence or machine learning in robotics? Let me give you an example. So one example here is image understanding, right? Computer science and machine learning has made immense progress in terms of understanding images using expressive machine learning models, such as deep neural networks. And these tool are the, tools are the best tools out there in terms of extracting information from an image. And so how that typically looks like and how these tools work is you collect the big, tra big training data set, which you see on the left, which includes lots of Im images. And you label these images with the correct answers. So for the example I show you on the right, you know, we want to see we wa the algorithm should extract what it sees in the image, which is, you know, a cat and a dog and a duck. And so you tell the you give this training example to your algorithm, including those labels, and then you train a neural network to map input images to labels of what it sees in the image. Um, and so that that works really well, and that's called supervised learning. And you is the state of the art, for example, for image understanding. Now, if we look at robotics, these techniques, are, we cannot really think about robots anymore without these machine learning tools. For example, this is a scene that a self-driving car would see, right? And here, machine learning is used to segment the image. So this image goes into a machine learning model, and out comes this, this segmented image where you see, see where the cars are, where the buses are, red are the pedestrians and cyclists. Um, the, you know, um, the road is labeled. And so basically it helps the algorithm to know where, where it can drive and what it has to pay attention to. And so there's no way we can think of self-driving without machine learning anymore. But there's a big difference between the typical image understanding tasks in, in, in machine learning where an image is the input and information is the output if we apply these tools now in robotics, where the image is the input still, but a physical action is the output as a result, ultimately, we use that information to decide what the robot can do next, should do next, right? And so there is this feedback loop where then the physical action that we do moves the robot, like the car, and as a result, it sees something different in the next time step. And so um, if we make a small mistake in terms of interpreting the image, it can lead, could lead to a wrong action that can lead to a worse view of the scene, which could make the whole thing worse. So there's this complexity that really comes from the interaction with the environment. So we really have to understand well how these machine learning tools work in such a closed loop system where the result um, changes the information in the next step. Um, but if we can combine and understand the, this well, so if we can combine control theory with machine learning successfully, we can really do amazing feats with robots that we couldn't do before. And so one early example from my work is this robot learns from practice to fly a slalom trajectory. And so it, it learns uh, above the poles, but once it is certain it can do the task, you know, it would go down uh, and can fly the slalom trajectory. And here you see it fly a different trajectory that it also learned from scratch. And if you compare that to our traditional approaches that are purely based on our prior physics knowledge, 
this is what it looked like, right? We couldn't do this task with traditional methods. Pew basically because our understanding limited the performance of the robot, we didn't, it's really hard to understand the aerodynamic effects in this case. And so it's really hard to um, do this task in a traditional way. So given, after having given you this one example of how a robot can learn, let's look a little bit more deeply what we do. So really what we do is, we try to deal with the uncertainty in, in the world, which we cannot easily model with traditional models. Um, and so how we describe this is, for example, through some of these difference equations, where part of the behavior may be known ahead of time through physics laws and Newton's laws, but some parts are unknown and hard to understand. And so, uh, and for us, the robot is, an input and an output so we can send some commands to the motors of the robot and we can measure what it does. Um, a traditional way to kind of enable, for example, a robot to fly is to purely base your decision-making component on your prior information. So the F and the H. And so design a controller based on F and H only because that's the only thing we really know. Um, and, and use that approach, but that approach, as you've seen, can, can keep vehicles in the air, as I showed in the very first um, video. So, and, and this, this approach can be really powerful, right? It, it, can, um, be, it can be robust to uncertainties and correct for certain disturbances. So here's just a little video. It's purely model-based control, right? The robot pushes this bucket, even so there are complex interactions with the bucket and the floor. And even if you push it a little bit to the side, the robot can correct and, you know, continue the task of pushing this um, bucket forward. Um, limitations come in when these unknown parts become really dominant and limit the performance. And so what you saw for the slalom is what you see here in this image. So we wanted the robot to follow with these traditional methods. We wanted to follow the blue line, but really what it did each time around is one of those colored lines. And so each time it did the task, it did it wrong because there was systematic model errors that we didn't account for. Um, and that made the robot behave suboptimally. And so the first thing is, yeah, why don't we then instead of, you know, somehow modify this reference input in a way that leads to the correct motion. And that's exactly what we did for the slalom trajectory. So here you see the image um, to the left. So over multiple iterations, which you see at the top, we slowly get better at following this path by modifying this reference signal. And because that's just a reference signal and not in part of this feedback loop, um, there's really no danger that this vehicle would crash. Um, and then you see at the bottom left plot, after you know 10 iterations, we, we, we um, successfully um, do the task uh, in every iteration. So this was great and led to you know successful slalom um, flying, but it meant that we needed to learn for each new task from scratch because we ultimately just look at the task we see the robot's performance and then we nudge this reference signal to the gray shaded area or gray shaded box each time a little bit and so the next step that we did is can we do something a little bit better and so this is basically still something that sits outside of the feedback loop which makes it much more safe um, but we learn a full inverse model. And with that approach, we could um, start to learn and um, perform these hand-drawn trajectories. So we learned this green box once from uh, you know, a set of training data, usually around 10 to 20 minutes of flight. And then once we learned that green box, we could fly 
the any any trajectory, any hand drawn trajectory, and we typically get you know a 62 percent um, error reduction. And so if if you come to the lab, you can actually try this out because you can draw on a tablet, and then you can see the robot fly it. And so here you see what is drawn in red and in green what the robot does after learning, which is pretty good compared to the original um, performance, which is the gray line. We also did other fun projects that really pushed um, the limits and of accuracy of robot motion. And one is catching balls. So at this, you know, um, this is a really difficult task because the robot needs to be at the right place at the right time to catch the ball. And so using machine learning in this case, similarly to what I just described, improved the success rate for catching by about 20% and we got a success rate of 85%. So we don't catch every ball. It's still a very challenging task. So here you see some examples of catching and this is real time. So it's almost hard to see even the ball. And so here you see a few more close-up speeds, uh, close-up motions. And here you see some failure cases. Um, here we didn't predict the motion of the ball accurately. And in the second example, the, just the robot motion didn't follow what we intended the robot to do accurately enough. So to summarize this first set of books, we kind of leverage the feedback architecture to be safe by placing this learning module in green outside of the actual fast feedback loop. And that guaranteed us stability, so meaning these vehicles don't fall out of the sky or do something crazy. But um, these methods required a training phase and they couldn't um, accommodate what we call state constraints. So allowing the, or guaranteeing that the robot stays within bounds. Right? For a flying vehicle, you don't want it to fly against the wall. So you want to guarantee it stays within some space bounds. For a self-driving car, you, you want it to stay on the, on the road, right? Uh, so explicit guarantees for this were not able in, this in these approaches. So next, we looked at how we can incorporate more probabilistic machine learning models in a feedback loop. And I just give you one example, but this is still an active, really active area of research, not only by micro, but it's growing in interest um, with various applications to physical systems. But here's, here's one example how this can work. And so we have again the robot, and now we have these state and input constraints. So the the state of the robot, so its position, for example, should stay in a certain bound, and the input should also stay in some bounds, right? Usually we have, there are some actuation limits, so limits how fast the motor can spin that we should take into account. And so the architecture we use now is we have a, a stochastic model of um, the unknown component that we don't know, and we use that directly in the controller. And so we are initially very conservative about what we don't know. And that you can think of it as a function that can lie anywhere in this blue shaded area. So initially we assume we don't know much about the unknown component. And we just say it, it very likely lies in this large shaded blue area. Um, and then what that results in is that the robot behaves quite conservatively because it says i don't know really what my motion is like so let's be very careful and then we combine that with you know yeah a robust controller so in this case it's a specific um, machine learning model a gaussian process but there are others um, and we combine this with you know a, a basically a careful controller that takes into account this uncertainty as we move, though, we get information about how the robot behaves. And these are the blue data points. And so that shrinks our uncertainty envelope over time. And as a result, you know, we, we get a bet much better idea over time how the robot behaves. 
And as a result, our actions can be more and more optimal for the given situation. And so, but the key is that we have these uncertainty bounds that always tell us what is the worst that could ever happen, right? And therefore that allows us to be safe even so the learning module is in the in this closed loop. And so here you see an example. So here's the robot driving and it's hitting these pylons because we didn't model all the dynamics well um, of this robot driving on grass. Um, and then we use this learning-based model and we can drive basically very successfully through those pylons eventually after, you know, because we, we learn the dynamics. And you see this um, pink shaded area that always tells us our uncertainty. And we always make sure this uncertainty stays within the, the path bounds and guarantee safety this way. So what this gave us is um, these algorithms have stability and performance guarantees. They don't require a training phase. Um, so they just start very conservatively and get better over time. And they can explicitly take these state constraints into account. So they're, they're a great tool. I have missed some of it, of course, whenever you want to prove something, you need to make certain assumptions. There are still assumptions. And one of the main ones is that our true uncertain, or uncertain function lies within that blue shaded area. And so that is something that, you know, um, we need to design correctly um, there. And so there are still assumptions. There are also difficulties to scale this to very high dimensional systems such as robot arms, but um, it's a first step in the right direction. And as I said, this is um, an active area of research for any system that interacts with the real world. Finally, I want to briefly talk about benchmarks and evaluation metrics as a way to improve the safety of robot learning. And if anyone is interested in this, I'm very happy if you, um, you know, touch base later and um, contribute to that effort. And the reason here is that really a lot of benchmarks to compare algorithms or test algorithms and train algorithms look like this, right? They're, they're more like games, all these artificial characters or very simple system, like the right top one should be a you know, car driving on a hill. Um, and then there are a bit more complex ones like these robot arms. So these are simulation environments where you can test and develop your algorithms and also compare different algorithms. So right now, we work on a set of new benchmarks for safe learning that allow much more realistic robot scenarios um, that allow us to distinguish what you know ahead of time. Usually you have some knowledge about how the robot moves. Ultimately, you built the robot in the first place, um, but then combines it with real world behavior. Um, and I showed you there are different ways to learn, right? learn as the robot moves or learn from data that was collected ahead of time. All these things we want to reflect in those um, simulation benchmarks. You want to specify safety constraints and also define ta you know, more complex tasks um, that start with simple tasks for people to get started. These, these are also a great way to democratize research because robotics research requires a lot of hardware initially that is not available to everyone. And so we hope that these benchmarks help um, uh, to drive a bigger community effort towards algorithms that really work on real robots. And yeah, so ultimately the goal of these benchmarks is that they help us to develop quickly in simulation and then are able to translate those learned results to the real world um, and enable this transition because the simulation is much more realistic as the ones um, currently available. And so if anyone is kind of more interested in this effort or more on the computer science side, um, you know, join us. So ultimately kind of I showed you 
like three very quick ideas how we work on safe robot learning. One is through feedback design and you know really leveraging our background in control theory to place machine learning modules into the loop without jeopardizing safety. The other way is to use probabilistic machine learning models. And the third way we explore is learning in realistic simulations to um, then transfer that knowledge to the real world. And really what it boils down to is that we combine models and data and really hope for high performance, um, safe and data efficient um, learning in robotics. Now I want to zoom out again and just go back to this image where, um, where I showed you that we have lots of enabling technologies she's that really can drive robotics innovation and um you know what i showed you is how control theory um, you know the latest hardware and machine learning can be used to um, build more capable robots but this is not the full picture robotics is really itself an enabling technologies for a lot of application areas that have a big societal impact such as health mobility and manufacturing and I see in the next decades that robots will really move into these applications. And you can really think of robotics similar uh, as a similar to technology to computing itself, right? We cannot envision any part of our lives without um, computers or, you know, small versions of computers in some form. And robotics is similar in that it can really be an enabling technology in a lot of these application areas. And so if you remember one thing from my talk, I hope it's this image that really shows, you know, how robotics is on the one hand driven by enabling technologies, but it's an enabler itself. And just to give you one kind of very specific example. So here you see continuum robots, so robots that move more like an elephant trunk. And um, those are enabling technologies for both aerospace inspection, but also surgery. And so it means really that you can be an, an amazing robotics researchers in all these areas. But I want to emphasize that it's not this last step we shouldn't take for granted. It's really difficult. It requires a lot of collaboration and communication across boundaries and thinking about the real societal needs. And I think that's where really the cross-disciplinary work happens. And I just did a little bit of that work, but two out of my top 10 cited papers are on the application side, which just shows that there's real potential. And so these robots will come in all different types and shapes and forms and you know, may look like a human, humanoid or more like a, a small pill, but um, yeah. It's really the question, what areas um, do we want to disrupt next? And finally, um, if you fully zoom out of this picture, I've talked about you know, enabling technologies and how they drive innovation. Um, but it's a much bigger system. So on the one hand, you know, we have things that we teach our students in terms of fundamentals and enabling technologies, and then they get hands-on skills. For example, we have the self-driving car team that won four times our self-driving competition, and you know, undergrads really learn how to build a self-driving car, and they get hired afterwards by the major players in self-driving. But I also think about the bigger picture, right? Um, there's definitely things necessary on the policy innovation side, global challenges, and you know um, how we approach teamwork in the setting that is really important to address. So right now we we are planning to set we are in the planning processes of setting up a robotics leadership program to address these additional areas that are really important to um, develop technology that that. Um, you know, helps us to build a better world. And just to give you one example, um, we also looked at, you know, how, how robotics has been used in the pandemic in a white paper that we published around this time last year, where we looked at how robotics has been used in the, to 
you know, alleviate some of the pains in the pandemic and how it could be used in the future. So I'm really happy to broadly connect with you. Um, if any of you is interested in robotics and how it can shape our future, because it's a big task to really make this happen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this um, intriguing lecture. And in work and network is also what Humboldt Foundation is all about. So I like that very much that you stress this out. Um, so now the floor is open for questions from the audience. As indicated earlier, you may either write your questions directly into the chat and we would read them out for you to Professor Schalik, or you may just type the word question into the chat and wait until we ask you to unmute yourself. So please, the floor is open for questions. Okay, there is a first question in the chat. Also uh, a nice comment, uh, which you might uh, want to look at later. <laughs> Professor Schellig, uh, the first question is, thank you for your talk. I work in the area of robot ethics and have worked as a member of a robotics team. Hearing you speak about the need for a multidisciplinary approach, I wonder if you work with ethicists or have an ethicist as a part of your team? I have not currently. I do have to say that um, you know, my research has been very technical, some of what you've seen and, and more of that and math. <laughs> but um, I guess I have worked on application areas in construction, mining um, and communication where, where robots are used um, and collaborated this way, but not yet kind of looked further. Yeah, definitely interested. Thanks for the question. Okay. Um, while we are waiting for more questions or participants to indicate that they have a question, um, I will read out the comment um, on your talk uh, by Professor Dr. Günther Brenn. Um, indeed, robotics is already widely in use in neurosurgery and physicians appreciate it very much, despite some limitation in its abilities. A hybrid operation making good use of robotics together with the manual conventional work put out best results. <laughs> The yeah, <laughs> totally agree. Totally agree. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a collaborative effort in, in most places. And, you know, um, one of my uh, really role models who is 88 and still working in robotics always says we need to put the human in the center if we design this technology. Yeah. Okay. Next question is, what are areas of open research that you would like to focus on moving forward from Dr. Rosa? Yeah, great question. Um, for me, it is really, I mean, ultimately what motivates me is, is you know, in, in building robots that seamlessly integrate into our work and, and personal lives and um, provide us capabilities that we would not have otherwise, right? Nobody can imagine a life without a mobile phone anymore. Um, and so, yeah, I envision robotics also having a role like this. But on the other hand, it's a gradual process, right? People have been working in this field for, for decades, and so it will not happen overnight. It's a gradual process, and we know what is easier and what is more difficult, right? Self-driving is certainly one of the more difficult tasks because the uncertainty and unpredictability in the environment. And so I think that that's the driving force behind a lot of the research in my the, uh, in my uh, in my group, but also more generally is how can we enable robots to deal with more complex and uncertain and unpredictable environments, such as, for example, self-driving or in your home, right, where that you move things around and every day it looks slightly differently. Um, that's a very different environment than what robots are working in right now, which is, you know, in industrial environments where it looks the same each day, the task is the same each day. Yeah. So I think that that's really um, where I think we can still make a lot of progress. And this involves algorithm design to a large extent because often the hardware is there, but the algorithms are not. 
Okay, and there is the next question connected to self-driving. Uh, what do you see as the major challenges for a full adoption of autonomous vehicles, both technical and logistical? For example, what kind of modifications to urban planning and transportation networks would be needed in your opinion? Mm -hmm. I like the last part of this question because often people think, you know, um, a lot of the research today in self-driving assumes the cars have to work on the roads as they are. They, they basically, we are not allowed to make modifications to the environment. And I think that's ultimately wrong. We always build environments and infrastructure to help us. I mean, we build lighthouses such that ships can navigate more safely, right? Um, and we build whatever road signs and, la um, and lights to help humans to navigate the roads. So I think um, the this part, is not well studied yet or is not a priority at least in north america and um something to consider um to make this really a safe technology yeah full adoption it will be gradual right as i said before there are things that are easier if a, if a car or a truck always um, drives along the same route um, it's much easier to make that work safely than um, building this generic self-driving car that works um, 24 hours a day. Um, many people are happy if, <laughs> for example, also for drone delivery, if it only works two hours a day, if we find the right weather conditions and during those weather conditions it works, um, that would already be great. So I think it's a gradual process. Um, will take them a long time to, to make it work everywhere at any time. Okay, question from a different research field. Uh, legal science is also becoming increasingly open to robotics, for example, as assistance to systemize laws or search for court case law. Are you optimistic about this for legal science? Yeah, I'm not sure if I would call this robotics um, or rather artificial intelligence, because do you really the, need the physical representation of the robot there? or just a piece of software. Um, yeah, um, other than that, yes, um, as an assist, like as an assistive tool, I think this will definitely come, right? Um, will it ever kind of make the court case? Maybe not, like be creative and do that. But as a, as a tool, similar to, you know, your search tools right now, yeah, I mean, those will become more clever, I think. Okay. You mentioned that your work uses mathematics as its fundamentals. As a mathematician, I would be interested whether you see fundamental open math questions in the area. Do you think advantages on the mathematical foundations may have big impact? Yes, yes. I think the advances in mathematics can have a big impact. Um, yes, um, being specific is a bit harder. Um, I think probabilistic tools that then can also be efficiently be computed um, is something that that we would love to have um, so i think yeah on the probabilistic side i, I feel we still do use uh, you know two known um, laws Bayes theorem and um and kind of um and i think if there are efficient ways or approximations that is, would be very helpful. Um, beyond that, um, understand, better characterizing and understanding neural networks from a mathematics perspective, for example, is also um, very interesting. But a lot involves stochastic and probabilistic approaches, I think. Um, but I'm not a mathematician. Uh, and, and the dynamic aspects of robots, right? That robots move over time, that you can describe them as differential equations and partial differential equations and how that can be mapped into machine learning models in an efficient way. Okay. I will combine two questions that ask about social aspects. One is, um, are you positive about the idea of robots becoming friends? Or do you think we should keep thinking of them as tools only? And the other one um, is the question about uh, if robots will soon be able to force people out of the labor market, so becoming comp competitors on the labor market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So friends, um, very quickly, I think I always underestimate how quickly people relate to 
things. <laughs> um, so yeah, there is generally a quick adoption. It's, it's very surprising, like a, a colleague works with elderly and um, they're extremely open to this once they see that. So I think, yes, <laughs> could happen. Um, could happen. Um, and the other question about labor for and workforce, this is a really good one, right? Um, and clearly there will be some jobs that can be replaced, for example, in Amazon warehouses, there's still lots of people working on the last part of packet, you know, putting the products in a package, um, which is a tedious task and not necessarily also the most enjoyable, that could be replaced with robots, you know, in the next decade. Um, so I think, yes, some jobs will be lost, right? But overall, if you look, I have some statistics about Canada. Um, the companies that adopted robots, they actually, their number of employees increased in every, in, in every case, like by 20%. That's statistics from Canada, so I don't have it for worldwide, but this means that somehow maybe the the company became more productive or in other you know in other ways um developed but basically they hired more people over the next 10 years if they started um, um deploying robots or using robots so um yeah it's definitely something to look out for and um but overall i think especially in germany you know Germany should be extremely aggressive. Our labor costs are high and um, replacing some with robots would be great. We have a great education and using people for more high level tasks to stay ahead of the technology curve would be really important, I think. Thank you very much. Um, we have four more questions that we might be able to put into three questions and maybe yeah. if you answer briefly. This is such a fascinating yeah. topic. We could talk for hours. But um, I would also afterwards like to close the floor. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be quick. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, Katja, uh, you have already combined uh, questions, so, or should I just continue? I didn't. Oh, however you like. I just okay. thought two, okay, five key uh, questions would be a, uh, you could combine them. <laughs> okay. So um, the first question is. Um, Sorry. Uh, if, have you seen the movie Ex Machina? How close are we to that level of sophisticated robots? Um, I watched it. Um, I, I can't, like, I watched it a while ago. I mean, probably it's not realistic. <laughs> I don't remember all the details, but uh, yeah, uh, would need to watch it again. Should watch it. Okay. Yeah. And then um, the question is, um, um, connected to autonomous cars, uh, which questions are still open in this part? Do you think that 5G will be the ultimate solution? And also, what are the new changes to robotic research in the era of 5G? So, yeah, um, so I, I think so. Fi the 5G question is the easier one. Um, in some way, roboticists have often thought of the robot as this entity and all the sensing has to be on the robot, all the compute has to be on the robot and it needs to be fully autonomous, right? With better communication and um, you could offload a lot of compute to the cloud and you know communicate very um, without lots of delays um, with the cloud. And so I think, you know, we will definitely see that in robotics and then the, the 5G helps to reduce delays, time delays, which are critical in robotics, right? we, robots need to act fast. Um, but then, you know, your phone does that as well, right? Uh, it offloads compute to the cloud. And I think we will see the same um, if those communication um, links are really reliable. Um, it could also be used for robot-to-robot -robot communication. Um, there are other tools as well. Um, it will find its way there, but um, I think the offloading to the cloud will be the big one. And then, you know, then you could have a more central control. Then in the cloud, the cloud could control multiple robots at the same time and coordinate them. And so it changes the picture from this kind of robot as an entity 
to kind of a more of a system. Okay. And uh, two last questions on uh, your research. The one is, do you also research on building better models for self-learning of machines? And the other one is, if you collaborate with brain researchers. Um, I don't explicitly collaborate with brain researchers right now, so this would be super interesting. Um, and, you know, has driven some of the latest um, big advances in machine learning have been kind of been driven in this collaboration with brain researchers um, in, uh, inspired by um, how the brain works. Um, yeah, happy to connect if um, would be very interested. And um, the other question was about... Um, do you also research on building better oh. models for self-learning of machines? Yeah, yeah, we do that um, as well. Um, especially taking this dynamics aspect into account that robots move and we have some understanding right for example you know the position of the robot is the integral of the velocity and that, that is basically universally true can we kind of incorporate this prior knowledge into our machine learn learning models yeah great wonderful once again professor schelling thank you so much for this Thank you. Wonderful, fascinating lecture. And also thanks to the audience for joining us. And you're all very welcome to join our open forums in a minute. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>